this is going to be a good one today. We got an interview coming on later in the show. I am joined by the another another covering person, Kyle Pepitone, my assistant producer. He's covering for the co-host, Cam Martin. And we got we got one regular here today. We got one regular. That's Allie Leach. Allie, Kyle, thank you both for being on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm ready to get started. Ready, ready to get started. Here. I like the enthusiasm, yeah. Allie. You've been promoted. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. That's real. That is great, Allie. I, I just promised you a promotion, but only if your newscast goes well. Thank you. I think it should go well. Okay. Well, <laughs> then prove me wrong. All right. Here we go. So, um, in international news, Europe unveils a plan to shift away from fossil fuels over the next nine years. The New York Times reports that this is a big moment in the global effort to fight climate change. The effort pushed forward by the, Europe, um, the European Commission makes the 27 country blocks proposal the most aggressive and detailed plan in the world to reach a carbon neutral economy by 2050. And in national news, as vaccinations slow in the US, the Delta variant is driving a rise in cases. The New York Times reports that daily case numbers have increased at least 15% over the last two weeks in 49 states including 19 states that are reporting at least twice as many new cases a day. Full-fledged outbreaks have emerged in a handful of places with relatively low vaccination rates, including Arkansas, Missouri, Louisiana, and Nevada. And in local news, Montclair State University will receive more than $1.4 million from the state of New Jersey to address the impacts of COVID-19. Patch.com reports that on July 12th, Governor Murphy and the Secretary of Higher Education, Brian Bridges signed the grants to Montclair State and 35 other public institutions. And now it's time for a weather update. In Montclair, it is currently 78 degrees with a high of 88 and a low of 73. And we are in a heat advisory from 11 a.m. today until 8 p.m. tomorrow. So drink water and stay cool. That, that, that actually, funny enough, is what our first story has to do with. I, I got a quick question for you, real quick. Yeah. Um, this is. Probably the most serious question you'll ever be asked, all right? Okay. Did you say Nevada? <laughs> yeah, I said Nevada. Is it Nevada? I don't know what it is. I've always said Nevada my entire life. So I, there goes I, your promotion. I've heard both. I like, I don't know. Nevada sounds like, sounds more like state-like in my opinion. It kind of does. It's got, even though it's, it is technically southern. It has that southern twang, even though it's not really the kind of southern you would think that have, that would have a right. twang. That's a funny word, twang. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop rambling. We are gonna move on to our first story of the day about this aforementioned heat wave. As July continues onward, surprise, surprise, we have a lot more higher temperatures and a bunch of humidity, followed by, of course, thunderstorms. Here's why New Jersey's become florida this year reason number one july is usually the hottest and in some areas the wettest month of the year in the state there are also some atmospheric conditions contributing to the weather ap news says that according to meteorologist stephen DiMartino, quote the first culprit is the large dome of high pressure that has been stuck to our south and east near bermuda commonly known as the bermuda high no not the bermuda triangle this huge mass circulates clockwise and pumps hot, moist tropical air from the Bahamas and the Gulf of Mexico into our region. DiMartino also says that this pattern of high temperatures could be done in about a week, week and a half, but of course, it's got to return soon afterwards. We may want the rain, rain to go away, but it's going to come again some other day. Another possible culprit is that the climate change is warmer as global temperatures have increased the rate of moisture. So at the end of the day, it, it all comes down to climate change. Yay. <sighs> okay. If you want to go on a vacation and you live in New Jersey, you want to go somewhere hot, you don't have to leave. I'd even think about comparing this state to Florida. I, I wonder what it feels like in Florida right now. I can let you know in about, what is it, two weeks time? Two weeks, please do. Yeah, about two weeks and a day. It so. is. So. That should be fun. Yeah, it is astounding to me 
the severe effects of climate change without not everybody recognizing it. Right. Because this is in some unbelievable way it has become a controversial issue if it exists. It's science. It is literally science. And it's stuff like this that's making and make the fair I, assumption that's making everybody's life harder. Right. And I would say because July is naturally the hottest month here in Jersey, that's giving people um what's it called? Like a cause for deniability. They're like, oh, it's not climate change. July is normally this hot for Jersey. It, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, I, so. I was helping move furniture around yesterday. And Ooh. let me tell you, ooh, I was helping my friend move. I was sweating bullets the entire time. And yes, that's partially because I was doing manly, manly work. But also because it was hot. Is just, it's unbelievably hot outside. Yeah, it's not even like there's like a break day. Like just you look at a the weather app and it's just nineties all week long with the little scattered cloud thing paste every like day or so or every other day or whatever. Which I, I don't mind that part. I like the rain part of it. <laughs> the heat, uh not not my thing. Yeah, exactly. And I I, I'm a guy. This would be this would be a little off topic, but not. I'm a guy who likes to, who likes to put some effort into how I dress. All right, it's so much harder to dress well when it's hot out. All right, it gives me so little options. It makes me so unhappy. I mean, I don't have that problem. Yeah, I, mean, I, I imagine I've, most guys don't. I wear the same thing year round: uh, jeans, short sleeve shirt, black denim jean jacket. Regardless, that's my outfit 365 days a year. And I've mentioned this on the show like several times. Well, that's because you don't get hot. I've also heard about that, right? Yeah. Well, to an extent, I there's at, there's <laughs> some limit I can take. Like everyone, of course. But yeah, it's uh you know, it's it's my thing. I've been wearing it to work uh all week and the week before that. And the week before that, I come on the show every Monday with it on. So, you know, that's my thing. Yeah. Allie, what are your thoughts about this? You've been kind of quiet. I don't know. I was just thinking that, like, I don't know. It is kind of really hot and it kind of does scare me because I would, <laughs> I've been like sitting outside and I like in my head, I'm like, is it just me or is it like unusually hot right now? Because I'm someone who I prefer being cold. I'd rather there be cold a is so snow much up better. Room. Yeah, you can bundle up. Yeah, there's no way to cool down, but you can bundle up, and yeah. So I'm just glad to know at least I'm not going crazy and like that the world is heating up. But I we're um, burning, but we're burning together. We are burning together. I was also like just like kind of curious about how Kyle does it like sweat to death in jeans in this weather. He said he <laughs> well, wears jeans in this Okay, weather. so number I one you. Yeah, number one, I burn very easily. So instead uh, of sunscreen, I just like to cover up. I find that easier. And second, uh, I recently found out like I don't know exactly what, but like the window in my room is in a sense broken. So like the seal or something doesn't work. So like during the summer, it can reach up to like 80, 90 degrees in my room itself. So I think I've just kind of gotten used to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'd, I'd like to complain. I'd like to send a, a send a complaint out to Volkswagen before we go to our next story. My car is a Volkswagen and I am upset. My AC has been broken. It broke maybe a month ago. Right at the start of summer. It is painful every single day. I step into my car. I feel like I just stepped into a, a sauna that is hot, like a hot sauna, not just like a regular one, a hot yeah. sauna. It's terrible, and it makes me just, mm-hmm. Mm. And then I got rolled down the window. Know. I got rolled down all the windows while I'm driving, which is cool and all, but I burn. <laughs> I'm so pale. I burn with the windows rolled up. 
Make me roll <laughs> them down? That's a whole other story. You got to get yourself on. a winter coat. Get myself a winter coat. Well, then I don't have AC to help. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But now, now I have to know, do you have, is your car leather, the interior? Yes, it is. Oh, uh, that doesn't help at all. Yeah. But the leather is so much more comfortable. It is. That's part yeah. of the But it conducts heat a lot. It does. But I like my car. Actually, yeah. do I? No, I probably don't. Kyle, tell us the next story while I try to decide if I actually like my car. All right. So according to the Wall Street Journal, a brain implant lets a man speak, speak, uh, after being silent for more than a decade. California researchers are currently working on a device that can translate complete words from just brain signals. This device can be used to help people who have lost the ability to speak due to accidents or illnesses. However, this brain-computer relationship from this kind of technology is still in its early stages. Researchers enlisted the help of a man in his 30s who couldn't speak for 15 years, and after 50 sessions over an 81-week period, the machine was able to correctly interpret the man was correctly able to interpret the words the man was thinking 47% of the time. The experiment consisted of showing the subject a series of individual words and having the device measure his brain activity as he imagined saying the words out loud. The results jumped to 76% accuracy when introducing word prediction programs, uh, the kind of things you would see in uh, email or Word documents nowadays where they can kind of uh, predict the next few words you might type in a sentence. Eddie Chang, a a neurosurgeon at the University of California, said, quote, To our knowledge, this is the first successful demonstration of direct decoding of full words from the brain activity of someone who is paralyzed and cannot speak. It shows strong promise to restore communication by tapping into the brain's natural speech machinery, end quote. So although early stages, this is pretty cool because it's a series of electrodes that are, uh, I believe, surgically um, implanted in a person and they they monitor the brain activity and the goal is to have it be able to interpret what words in a sense a person is thinking and then translate them into uh i believe an auditory message so if you break it down enough it's kind of like a form of mind reading yeah i was gonna say this sounds eerily close to mind reading yeah Uh, you just made this so uncool Oh, I'm sorry. Mind reading is terrifying, Kyle. Oh, well, That's like one of my biggest fears. Yes, I mean, if you break down the semantics of it, it is, you know, a terrifying thing to believe in if such a thing exists. Because you probably don't know... Like, the person who has mind reading powers probably doesn't go around displaying that they have the powers or advertising that they have them. And so... You don't know. And I can totally see your fear, but I don't think <laughs> this is exactly. But then again, if it's translating the brain signals of the words you're thinking, everybody's constantly thinking. Yeah. So how oh. does it distinguish when somebody actually wants to talk? Yeah. All around. This is so cool, though. Yeah, no, totally. Science, man. Science. Where's where's Bill Nye when you need him? This is awesome. I know. This I mean, it's is amazing. Yeah, keep going. I I'm just more amazed that this is something that can be done. I feel like as we go more and more into the future, we're doing things that were previously thought impossible. You know, if you look back in the day, there were people who would write science fiction books with cell phones, stuff like that. And back then, they'd be like, oh, that's, that's never going to happen. But now, now look we're, at us. we're getting Video even calls. crazier. Yeah, that Kyle, is true. Can, Kyle, you talk more about this. Uh, I, I don't know what else to say about this other than, like, well, first of all, good for them. Like, this is, this is, like, the positive signs you like to see. Like, now people who have lost the ability to speak, which before this, I didn't even know like was a thing um you know like going on i didn't know like that was a possibility to like lose your ability to speak in a like mental like in a paralytic sense like i thought like the only way that could really happen is if somebody like lost their tongue i think is the way it happens 
uh, at least what I thought. But to see like this is an actual problem that people that some people have, and now there are scientists working on a way to fix it, you know, like that that just made my morning because that's really good news to hear. Of course, like I said, they're still in the early phases, but like a forty seven percent to seventy six percent jump in accuracy with the introduction of the word prediction algorithms, which I don't know about you, Ali or Kenny, when he comes back. Um, but those things are pretty accurate. Like typing emails and word documents, like. Yeah. They, they usually get it right. Like on the money, like what right, you're going to say. Exactly. I, I forget. I was typing something on here on, on our script today. I was filling out some notes and like it said, it kept changing completely accurate to whatever I was typing. Like it was not like, Oh, regular grammatic sentence structure. It was like topical stuff. So whatever, I, I think it was during our next story about the vaccine, but I kept typing like a word. And every time I like changed the like uh, tense of the word or something, it changed to something. And it wasn't a word relating to the vaccine. Like it wasn't, I typed vaccine and it auto-corrected with COVID. It was something like, uh, I think it was like the word get. And it said, vaccinated something like that that's terrifying yeah so at seeing that to predict what a person's what an actual person is going to say next in their speech patterns is just wow i mean yeah i if you are a repeat listener of the morning buzz i i i'd like to bring up the fact that i commonly talk about especially when we bring up science technology that my, one of my biggest fears is the uprising of the robots, for lack of a better term. Yes, Kenny, we know about your obsession with the toasters. Yes, with the toasters. <laughs> so here's the thing. While this is amazing, I'm scared of what could come next. Oh, yeah, of course, this, obviously. In my opinion, is teetering on the line of, okay, well, what, what can we do now? Because I feel like that's the next question, logically, and every single time something like this happens. Like, okay, we did this thing. It's amazing. But what can we do now? What can we do right. now with our toys? They're not actually yeah. toys. They're, they're actually very impressive. I don't mean to offend any scientists out there. Right. No, I, I see what you're saying. Like, we, we can essentially just interpret brain patterns to speech without the middleman of speaking, for lack of a better word. Now yeah. what? Yeah, and this this wasn't even brought up, but it was it was meant mainly for people who are mute and not able to speak. Right. But this could even be used for like international relations. People think in their own language and it translates to the language of the other person Ooh. if they don't speak it. This Good is something point. that could be global. Yeah. It could change the way that everybody communicates. There, would, there wouldn't be a need of learning other languages anymore, even though I still think languages are cool and people should. There, it's really changing more than just the health side of it where people just sometimes aren't able to speak. It's changing so much more. Yeah, that is a very good point. You ever see those, uh, those earpiece things where it's like they translate the speech coming in to another language? Yes. Yeah, Ali so. gets it. Ali gets it. All right, you're back being promoted again. We actually, we actually already have that. If you have an Apple Watch, you can talk into it in one language and it'll translate and speak back to you in another language. What? Interesting. There's an app called Translate you can get. If you have like an Apple Watch, like Series 5 or later, I have it on my phone and you just like hit the button, you talk into it and you can select from like 20 different languages and it will translate whatever you said into that language. Now, That's so cool. Yeah, how, how does it like run? Like, cause okay, like Google Translate's accurate. okay, but it's not always accurate. How is this one in terms of like? I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't speak all these languages, right, but yeah. I would trust it. You know, I would probably give it the same amount of trust that you would give Google Translate. Yeah, I think it's a good. It's a good start. Need in necessity, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Not like a crutch, but more of a, I don't know, thing that's not a crutch. Right, because every language has like their own rules, spelling, phonetic sounds. It's 
it's really hard to like machine at least at the moment it's very hard to like machine translate from one language into another with perfect accuracy especially or at least if you so get if you're getting into like full on sentences yeah. yeah so our next story that we have this is a covid story kind of i mean it technically is but also for you disney lovers high school musical the musical the series we've got we've got your girl olivia rodrigo Disney Channel star Olivia Rodrigo, she met with the president, Dr. Fauci, in an effort to encourage younger Americans to get the COVID vaccine. Although they are at a lower risk, Americans ages 12 to 17 are still encouraged to get the vaccine or to protect older family members and friends who may be at a higher risk. Rodrigo said, no, she didn't say sweat. That's not a word. Rodrigo said, quote, it's important to have conversations with friends and family members, encouraging all communities to get vaccinated. You know, I am surprised that a young celebrity is doing something good. <laughs> Usually, it was. I feel like it's just me. You see, you see most of the time that it's bad stuff, right? Right. Especially right. Disney stars have a track Disney record stars, of going off the rails at some point in their yeah. career. Disney stars have a bit of a track record with that. It's like, it's like they're trying to prove, like, no, mom, it's not a phase. And in, in actuality, it was a phase. Yeah. I am very impressed. I mean, and oh, I'd also like to mention that, for those of you who don't know, and one of her big songs is this one called Good For You. And, like, the first line of this article, it says, good for you, Olivia Rodrigo, or something like that. Yeah, yeah oh. I, I specifically didn't include that part. It it said, uh, uh, it, I think the exact words were, Olivia Rodrigo uh, wants people to know that vaccines are, quote, good for you. Oh, I love a good pun. It made uh, me so happy. I do I too, that. but emphasis on the word good. <laughs> I, think, I think every pun is good, honestly. Oh, yeah, uh, well, obviously. But That's it, right. It's, it's the cringe that makes them good. That's right. Agree with the boss, Kyle. Agree with the boss. Even though we're more coworkers. That's I mean, weird. yes, but I, 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 I was like the pun king back in high school. I read a pun book. King. Yes, I read a book on the semantics of puns and wrote an entire essay about it. Oh, that's. I want to read that essay one day. I have to find it. I don't know if I still have it. Anyway, back to the story. <laughs> back to the story. Yes, yes, back, back. This but no, no, I, is... I think this is really good. Like, yeah, you know, of course like, it's really good with the Delta variant and everything. Uh, we're seeing some states uh, with lower vaccination rates than others. Uh, the nation itself, I believe, as of I forget if it was this Monday or last Monday, uh, we weren't even at 50 percent of fully vaccinated adults yet. And I, I think I don't think we're still there yet. But um, even in this younger range, the 12 to 27 range, like. I, I, fi I feel like uh, the younger kids, like the teens, might not have that as much of a choice to get the vaccine as, say, like, uh, let's uh, give, I'll give the 20 to 27 range. They probably have their own personal choice, but I feel like uh, 12 to 19, they're probably still at the whim of their parents. Or in some cases, I, I don't want to say whim because it makes it sound like it's a bad thing, but like, I don't think 12 to 19 year olds have a personal choice per se. Like I think their parents would say, Hey, we're going to get your vaccine now. I think it Here depends on the parents and yes, the relationship between the parents. Right. Very true. And what I think is the best about this is that it is different. If somebody like who's someone, if, if Jennifer Aniston was saying to a bunch of teenagers, go get vaccinated. It's the oh, you're thinking about the related it's the best thing. For, it's the best thing for you to do. It's good for you. But Olivia Rodrigo is that age group. She gets yeah, it. She's 18. She she's 18. She is a role model for that group. She's someone that they feel like they can relate to and they'll actually listen to because of that. Right. Yeah. Using her fame for good. For you. Sorry. I couldn't resist. I couldn't. I couldn't resist. Allie, you've been a little bit quiet. What are you thinking? 
I mean, I think it's really cool. I um, was just like thinking about how like, I don't know. I was like kind of wondering too, kind of like what Kyle said. Like, I was thinking like if a 12 year old just like walks up to their mom and is like, mom, Olivia Rodrigo said you get my vaccine right now. I don't know if that's <laughs> much effect on the parent. Um, but I, I, think I think the first question the parent would ask is who? That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> But um, but yeah, I think it's a good thing, good thing that she's doing this because definitely the older people in that age group could be influenced by it, and right. she is the biggest pop star in music right now. Is she really? You know? Really? I knew she was a I mean, big I, deal, but like, is she really? I don't know if she was the biggest, but her entire album was on the top twenty for like a couple of weeks. Wow! Oh, wow! I have a critique album of her album. Like, took over like the U.S. top twenty. It was weird. It was like when it um not weird, but it was like crazy to see like her like so young but like driver's um, license like blew up records out of nowhere yeah it was crazy she just yeah. she's on it Good call me whatever you want but i love that song yeah i think it's beautiful i i um i don't know if i heard that one i think i heard a little bit if not the whole thing of i believe it was good for you and that that one's more punk pop or pop yeah punk. I, I was gonna say it has like a very paramore well that, kind of that's sound funny because there's actually like a, a controversy if she copied from them okay i'm not crazy because i I'm, I'm i was listening to it i'm like it's very paramore it's very i believe the song is misery, misery business, business. By them. yep that's the one yeah that's the one okay so i know something about music that's reassuring <laughs> for me <laughs> Oh, that, that makes me so happy that you didn't even know about that. It came up in your head. I didn't, I didn't know it was like an actual thing. I'm just like, yeah, this yeah is they, actually they sound like a, similar. This is a pretty big problem for her, actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's hilarious. Nice. But oh. Okay, well. Day, um... At the end of the day, we have all got to take the wheel for our vaccinations, get our driver's license, and just go straight into it and get the vaccine. I'm so proud of that pun. I'm really proud of that one. We are going to be right back here at WMSC for the morning buzz. We have an interview coming up, a live interview in about 15 minutes, but we got a couple more stories before that. We will see you in just a moment. I don't know whose voice that was. I couldn't even guess it, but they are right. You're listening to 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair, New Jersey. We are the Morning Buzz. We're not the regular crew except for Allie. This is Kenny Horn, joined by the co-host for today, Kyle Pepitone. We have our next story. So we talked a lot about Olivia Rodrigo. She, she was a big thing where she came up just out of nowhere. And another thing that came up out of nowhere, Tiger King, which I, I said actually pretty sarcastically. It was actually very good. I, I love Tiger King. Anyway, our story, Kyle, tell us about it. All right. So, Joseph Maldonado Passage, better known as Joe Exotic, appealed for a shorter prison sentence. Back in January of 2020, Joe was given 22 years in prison after being found guilty of attempting to use hired men to kill Carol Baskins, an animal rights activist, on two separate occasions. However, a panel of judges stated that the court treated the two sentences as separate occasions uh, when calculating Joe's sentence. The panel concluded that since both charges had a common goal in mind, uh, they should be treated as one, leading to a sentence ranging from seven, 17 and a half to 22 years instead of the 22 to 27 years that was part of the original sentence range. One attorney representing Joe said there's even a possibility that they were looking into a new trial, saying, quote, people should know that what they saw on television isn't the full truth. It isn't even the tip of the iceberg. It was the snowflakes on the tip of the iceberg, largely manufactured by those who wanted to see Joe Exotic in jail for their own benefit, end quote. So despite what uh, was seen in Tiger King, uh, this one attorney uh, claims it's not the full story and that because of which uh, he should be uh, either appealing for a shorter sentence um, or having a completely new trial in which uh, I assume new evidence will be brought to light or something, and he could maybe even be found innocent, I think. Did either of you watch Tiger King? Yes. No. You did. Kyle? 
Sorry. It's it's all right. I want to say that Tiger King, it at the end of the day, it is television. It is meant for entertainment. So I do believe that a lot of it is definitely exaggerated and it's probably very one-sided. However, I also think Joe Exotic is just a bad person. There are entertainment elements to the... I guess it's a docu-series. There are entertainment elements to the docu-series, okay? But it does still have that part of it where some of it is actual footage, stuff you can see of him doing, which is messed up. There's video proof, and I just plain don't think he's a great person. Right. And while I'm not wishing jail time on him, I don't think his jail sentence should be changed. Right. I see what you're saying. I mean, yeah. he's. Th- it's not just this one instant or two instances that he's being charged for. He's also got a lot of, um, what was it, nature. I forget the exact wording of it, but like natural, like wildlife. Um, Putting down tigers illegally. Yeah, that and um, lying about wildlife. Uh, he was vi- violating several wildlife laws. That's what it is. I forget the specifics of what they were, but they... It was more than one instance of uh, violating, you know, regulatory wildlife law, federal wildlife laws that he's also under scrutiny for. Yeah, exactly. And also, I'd like to say that Joe Exotic is the least likely celebrity I think I have ever heard of. Right? <sighs> Explain. Overnight, I feel like everyone knew who Joe Exotic was. He was the. Um, I, I feel like for a little bit, he was the biggest name in America. I mean, everyone was trapped inside. What else were they going to do? <laughs> I, I feel like that's probably part of the acclaim. But also that makes me think of how if he wasn't this huge celebrity, I doubt there would be right. anything going against going for him to have this appeal. And right. it, it's actually kind of funny because... Joe Exotic, clearly, if you watch the docuseries, his biggest dream is to just become a big celebrity. Everybody knows who he is. He he was already locked up by the time it came out. Right. So he never really got to see that, which I think in in a twisted way is kind of funny. But I think it's getting to a point where it's just helping somebody who's famous because they're famous. Right. It's also worth mentioning that, like it said in the article, that like if he does serve out this uh, 22 years, he might not make it due to uh, health complications. Yeah. Well, that's also another point. Because he has health complications, and while those are completely serious, and I hope he gets better, that is not a reason for you to get a lesser jail sentence. Right. At all. That has no relation to that fact. Yeah, that is true. It doesn't affect anything. Like I said, I hope he gets better with whatever he's struggling with. But it it just doesn't relate. Right? Yeah, no, not at all. Yeah, it kind of feels like people kind of like use it as like a way to like get out of going to jail, kind of. Yeah, exactly. That and... uh, by reason of insanity is another one that I think people take well, I, I, advantage of. Take advantage of is a good way to put it. Because I think that actually is a relevant defense. Right. But only in some cases. Yeah. Probably not only everyone. Only in very rare cases. That's why it's a that's why it's an exception to the rule of being guilty. Right. We're going to move on to our final story before we move on to our exclusive interview This is a fun one. I always like to have a funny story mixed in there. This one's about a New Jersey house cleaner. Uh, I I don't even understand how this happens. Kyle, can you please tell us about it? All right. So, Louis and Angelino Angelino the third uh, has been cleaning homes on the side uh, to make a little bit of extra money and was recently scheduled to clean one of his friend's houses in Cherry Hill. Angelino was meant to clean his friend Mark's house in Cherry Hill and had no problem getting in and cleaning the house and playing with the cats that were in the house. Only one problem. Mark didn't own any cats. (laughs) 
Angelino realized he spent the last two and a half hours cleaning the wrong house because he wrote down Mark's address wrong by one digit. <laughs> Mark left a note for his neighbors explain uh Mark left a letter for his neighbors, Beth and Tom Matzo, explaining what happened. Beth recounts her husband's phone call when he saw the note saying, quote, he said, you won't believe it. Somebody broke into our house and cleaned the entire thing. Swiffer and all. Swiffer and all makes it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Motzels were very amused by what happened. And Beth even said she'll be keeping Angelino's number for the future. <laughs> oh, that's my favorite part. Exactly. Like he he's like gotten like a little bit of publicity now and you know oh yeah his, his cleaning business. Well, the the people he accidentally cleaned for the Motzels, they dubbed him like the cleaning fairy and he's embracing that as part of his business oh, now. No. Oh my god. He's got to be he's got to be good. Yeah, I mean <laughs> Like the fact that they were just amused by this, like he he had to be like Mr. Clean levels of good for them to not even harbor like a little bit of how did that happen? Imagine you walk into your house after a long day of work and you, you left it a mess when you got there. Maybe you have a couple of kids running around or and cats. you walk home and it's it's spotless. <laughs> oh, oh that'd that be so amazing. fun that'd be terrifying actually yes but it'd also be like yeah. a relief like hey now i don't have to do this yeah. for a week or so yeah at least he covered himself with it right because he did say he tried to explain to them he left a little note that hey this was an accident i'm also i, I can't believe that they didn't lock the door well because no they just, did oh they he, did how'd he get he, in he, he had there was a key under the mat. I guess there Mark's was a house key under was, the mat. Yeah, and which is why he had no problem getting in because he just. I guess Mark must have told him, "Hey, when there's you come, the there's mat. a key under my mat. Go in, clean it, yada yada yada." And like, I, I guess a lot of people do that. I'm not a homeowner myself, so I don't know. But I guess that's like a big thing people do. You know, it, it's a. Big I've, TV I've been locked thing. out several times. It's a big TV thing. You always hear in TV shows yeah. like. Oh, you need a you need a spare key uh, to go get the one under the mat. Yeah, but that that doesn't work for like college dorms when the key is your ID card. You leave that in your room. You're not getting a second one. <laughs> yeah, you just gotta go bother the <laughs> RA or your roommates. Yeah, or your roommate. Yeah, or your roommate. But I think I don't. I'd really like to see this guy's face when he was saying to his friend that he was playing with the cat <laughs> and realized. <laughs> And he, he realized that his There's friend didn't no have cats. cats. Oh, I, I would have lost it. Imagine I, I, the look I'm, on I'm the guy's face. Yeah, I'm picturing it very similar to uh, the opening scene in Scream. In Scream. Yeah, where like the um, Drew Barrymore, I believe the actress is, is yes. talking to Ghostface and he just comes with the line, I want to know who I'm looking at. Like, I, I feel like it's the same level of realization. Well, you know, minus the, you know, life endangerment. Yeah, yeah, that's a good part. <laughs> minus the life endangerment. That one, but good for him. I'm sure this is making, you mentioned his business is probably booming now. He's probably getting calls all over the place, or at least some kind of way to be contacted. Right, yeah, contacted. he's uh, he's crowdfunding right now making and making t-shirts to oh. promote himself. Do, do they say the Queen the Fairy on it? I, I I hope they do. I mean, they got to, right? How could they not? I don't know. I you know, I I, I just think like I'm gonna give it maybe a year's time. I I think this guy's gonna take off and he's gonna wind up with his own brand of cleaning supplies. Like he's <laughs> going to be the competitor to Mister Clean. That is saying a lot, Kyle. I, you know, I I'm just. You know, I think it would be fun. I think it'd be awesome as well. We are going to take a very, very short break real quick. We are going to come back to our interview with Rostafa, the organizer of the Camel Music and Arts Festival. We are going to be right back. Goodbye for a very brief time. Every day across this country, hundreds of college radio stations take to the air 
broadcasting music and programming that you won't hear anywhere else. It's one of the last places where people can really be able to actually say what they want to say. Without it, you wouldn't have a place for local artists to perform. Certain people need to have a chance, a fighting chance, and College Radio is that place for it. College Radio changes the lives of those who are involved with it and can change those who listen to it too. This is where we start out, you know? From getting all this great experience working in college radio, it makes you want to work in real radio. College radio means finding yourself. It helped me find what I wanted to do in not only school, but in life. So support college radio by continuing to listen to this station and supporting the students who make it happen. College radio, now, more than ever. A message brought to you by this station and the College Radio Foundation. For more information, please visit collegeradio.org. Hey, you're listening to 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair, where music stays cool. Cooler than a dog on a skateboard. Okay, I take that back, but we're still pretty cool. Yes, we are. This is where music stays cool on WMSC 90.3 FM. We are, that's so much fun to say it like that. FM. We are joined by Rostafa for an interview about the, I said it wrong before, I'd like to say that, Kemet Music and Arts Festival. This is an African American heritage festival that focuses on strengthening the Black community through music and arts. Rostafa, thank you for coming on. Montclair State University, my old alma mater. How y'all doing? We're doing we're doing great here. At least us two are. Can't speak for all of them, but I imagine that we're all doing great. We've actually got a new president. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, I heard, and I wonder if they're going to change the term Red Hawk Country in a whole different meeting at this point. How do you mean? Well, I mean, like, you know, I mean, again, because like you know, the Red Hawk is basically named after a Native American sort of kind of like thing. Oh I'm thinking yeah. Because when I first heard that, I'm thinking. Is the bird about to die? <laughs> what is going on? And the next thing you know, they put out a statue, and then like that, like basically took money out of like students's like you know tuition, and then they had to pay more or whatever like that to, to a certain point, wherever the story was. And that was like right before I left. So it, it it's insane because I feel bad for like a lot of students that come in, and all of a sudden they got to pay all this extra money, and you know it is what it is. But you know, again, you know, we'll definitely. We'll definitely make it easier for the students eventually when, you know, time does draw near. I've got a cousin that went here and, re- and I was talking to her recently and she said, did you ever see that statue? I was like, yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, All I, right. I can, definitely, I can definitely tell you a lot of things about that statue. <laughs> yes. But you are here to talk about the festival. So can you tell us about it? Yeah. So Kemet Music and Arts Festival is a black heritage festival taking place this year in Montclair, New Jersey. The original one actually happened last year in Jersey City at Berry Lane Park. Uh, this basically sort of kind of came out of everything that was happening that past year when it came to civil rights, when it came to uh, just a lot of protesting, a lot of just a lot of negativity in the media. And my whole stint on it was definitely to create a atmosphere as well as a situation where music and art can basically tell stories about what we're going through and also at the same time be able to highlight black entrepreneurship as well as black local businesses at large and me and a number of other different people from jersey city including an organization called students demand hudson and uh, a number of other uh leaders within the um the civil rights movement were able to put on a great festival day luckily enough the weather was great uh there were a lot of politics that went into the festival (laughs) which i don't want to get into but put it this way we're able to pull it off this year we're going to be doing it at montclair brewery which is a black owned business uh as a matter of fact i think there's only four black owned breweries in the state of new jersey and there's actually maybe only three to four percent of that in the country wow and yeah exactly a lot of people don't know that and it's very difficult in that way to even become an owner of a brewery, let alone if you're a person of color that wants to really make a name for themselves. And uh, Mokla Brewery had been very, very good to us in terms of uh, allowing us to be who we want to be as people who are musicians, artists, local business people. And we just want to basically allow everybody to participate. doesn't matter what color you are. Mainly, we just want to say we want to support the black dollar. And the black dollar is no different from, you know, the Jewish community, a Asian community, 
or any other type of community that wants to establish that type of currency in the country. I mean, you obviously know about the Tulsa uh, in, in incident with, um, you know, Black Wall Street from 100 years ago. Yeah, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. It's one of our stories. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you understand that reestablishing the black dollar doesn't necessarily mean that it's a comfortable situation. Literally, you have to be uncomfortable. It's no different from going to church, right? Like, you know, you take 10, 15 percent of your income and you put it back into your church. It's no different from doing that in your community, um, whether it be an all black community or just black businesses within a community. And this really uh, means a lot to me because even after all the, you know, the the murders of, you know, people like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and uh, people like that, it really put the country in perspective, let alone the world in perspective, going, what's more important? Is it our material during this COVID crisis in which we're losing, or is it our own children? Is it our own family members? And this to me was a wake up call because I wanted to get back to my roots because from Montclair State University, I graduated from theater program, uh, the BA program. And, uh, you know, one thing that, you know, you're taught in theater is that, you know what I mean, you give it away, but not all away. And what you want to give away is the love, the support, as well as the admiration for a community that is not only been feel depressed and suppressed, but also the opportunity for them to tell their truth and their experiences. Now, what you don't give away, obviously, is the sense of, you know what I mean, we're, we're going to give up, we're going to live in fear and all that stuff. And we don't do that as people of color, let alone anybody really should feel. Right, definitely. And you said uh, beforehand that like a lot of this came from uh, or a lot of this started um, based off of what was going on last year, uh, what we saw around this time, all that going on. Was there any like um plans to do something like this before all that happened before all the stuff about uh racial injustice like it's always been uh in the media and stuff like that but before it became as big as it did back in 2020 was there any plans to do a festival like this for the for this community thing that you were discussing I've done um, actual like, you know, music shows that were like on a smaller scale or, you know, within a, uh, a confined space, uh, you know, coming from my theater background, you always rely on, on whichever building that you're in, unless you're doing like summer stock or outdoor theater. And for whatever reason, the idea came to me uh, literally at the last minute, like special ideas do. And um, I wanted to basically create a black Woodstock if you will, but not to the point where you're basically telling other, you know, nationalities, other cultures saying that they can't come. No, they're absolutely uh, available to participate because the one thing that I think people misconceptualize about current civil rights is that they're just thinking when you say black lives matter, you're thinking that it's only about us. And that's absolutely not true because, uh, and I'll give you a perfect example. Has anybody here seen Judas and the black Messiah? Not that I know of, no. I would implore you and your listeners to watch that movie because it's yes, there is a plight amongst black people, but it took entire communities of different nationalities and different backgrounds in order to see the plight of what was happening in communities, not just in terms of discrimination, but also in terms of classism, sexism, and all everything in between, because at this given point in time, it's not just the one of us that's hurting it should be all of us that should be hurting because if if this just affects just one community and not affects all that's not that's not being america that's not being you know a world village because at the end of the day last year which probably inspired me even more to do the festival was the fact that the world was protesting the yeah. world was marching the right. world wanted change and i mean the idea that a a, a person in iran is praying for the family of George Floyd. The fact that the Japanese were mobilizing in a very peaceful way. I mean, again, and people say, oh, well, there were riots and everything, this and that. Well, due to fact, there were very low percentages of that, regardless of. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned hey, that. This... To me, this is not just a festival. Yeah, it it isn't me... just a festival. Right. And also, this is a celebration. It is a celebration for black rights and helping out black people. But you mentioned that. That's probably another reason why I wanted to do it and make it. 
Yeah, yeah, probably is. You mentioned that this is supposed to help the black-owned business, black economy. And I'd like to know how that was, how that's been affected in the past year since you, you've done this festival before. This is the second time. How did this change it after the first one? Well, you know, it's funny, you know, when you have local businesses, especially those that we always pass by day by day and we don't really know too much about them. And we know we go to our favorite restaurant chains and we go to our quote unquote comfortable places. And, and here's the other thing, too. Don't just support these businesses just because they're just black owned. Support them because they're actually great businesses. And remember that during the pandemic, the local economy was was tanking in so many different directions because of the way that there was just not as much funding because the country, let alone the world, was not prepared for this pandemic. It was a worldwide plague. But if you really look at what was happening locally, even during the, the pandemic and people were you know, going through their, you know, their, their turmoil, they were still supporting their businesses. They were still supporting local businesses, not just corporate entities. And particularly, especially after June, July of last year, there was a huge spike in wanting to, to support black, brown, and other ethnic, uh, uh, you know, uh, other eth ethnic uh, businesses. And um, it, it's actually been very, uh, very wonderful just to see, like, you know, businesses thriving, even during one of our biggest crises that we've seen pretty much in the last hundred years. And I think, that this is a great opportunity to highlight certain businesses. For example, there's a business uh, that will be there called uh, the Artisans uh, Pop, uh, I believe Artisans Pop Boutique, who uh, the lady, uh, Louisiana, is a friend of mine, and we go back a couple years, and she is gonna be having two of her businesses there. One of them is a lemonade business, and the another one is an art business. And for those that normally don't go to Montclair or people that are coming from the outside, they will experience this whole idea of optimism to support people. I think, honest to God, human nature wants to help other, other people when everything in terms of ego and in terms of you know me, me, me is exited out the door. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about you, 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 it's about us. And it has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with, you know, all these distractions. It all has to do with faith. Right. It does. It does at the end of the day, you're right. Definitely. And now, can you tell us more about the, the music project itself that this fundraiser is going to? Yes. So last year I was on a marketing campaign uh, for an album that was dedicated to the black community. And uh, I use every type of platform and fundraiser to do it in every sense. And I think um, at the time, it was just so fresh in people's minds that they did not really know how to really conceptualize that, wait a minute, this brother and, and many other different Black artists are going to be doing an album and we don't really, you know, know. And just to give people context, I've been in, within the Essex County, Montclair, West Orange communities for pretty much most of my life. And I've always given back and I've always liked to have this idea of, well, it's not just about what you gain, but it's also about what others gain as well. So the concept became that once the album would be reached in terms of its goal of finances going into the studio for production, for distribution and everything that goes in between, that a quarter of that, those proceeds should go back into a black business that's in need. Um, I'm actually a huge advocate for the, uh, the mental health side of things, me growing up with a lot of uh, battles and, you know, head games and like most people do, the, you know, especially even now, but particularly in the black community, there's just so much trauma and so much uh, disparity in various ways that belief systems sort of kind of alter depending on, you know, who you talk to. And this project in itself uh, would be, first of all, honoring the black community and it, it, its culture not just through the songs, but really through the message. The message is what's important. And basically that this fundraiser, once it is completed, we would go in the studio. I would want to try to get this done by February of next year. I really wish I would have got it done this year if I had the funds. But this, uh, but coming up next year during Black History Month, I would believe that this would be the perfect opportunity to do that. And also 
again, for those that are going to be at the festival, you're not only going to be contributing to the fundraiser itself, but what you're also contributing are all the bands, all the vendors, including Montclair Brewery, uh, and just reestablishing, like I said before, the black dollar in order to understand that it's not just about me and what I'm doing. It's really about what we're all doing to support each other. Yeah, you could be just sending all the money to off to some fundraiser that is dedicated to helping black communities. But this is helping send out a message. Like you said, this is getting the word out, which at the end of the day is the most important thing. At least I'd imagine that. So, Absolutely. Yeah, it's the most important thing. So if anybody who is listening right now is interested in going to the festival, what do you think they should know? You should know that. And yeah. supporting black communities. <laughs> you should know that festival that you should be expecting some of the best musicality uh ranging across from funk to r&b to rock to blues to jazz basically black inventions from this country you should also expect some of the best food all around in montclair that have been chosen for this event um cilantro tacos which again amazing amazing truck you say uh, tacos I'm oh coming. yeah brother i'm coming oh yeah oh yeah uh we also have a little hot dog wagon we have like i said artisans uh boutique there's going to be uh, a number of also different painters so if there's anybody who's uh in itching to get some art in their house and definitely kind of light up the room there's actually going to be room for that and uh a number of other different uh entities we're also going to have raffle offs because I also believe in giving back also just in the little things. We may have some t-shirt raffles. We may have some merchandise. We also will have uh, maybe some gift cards going out to some of these uh, uh, lucky patrons who want to, like, you know, invest, like I said, going into a business and checking it out for the first time. So there's all these different things happening all at once. And also, mind you, that even if somebody is out of state and they can't be there physically, they can watch online via live stream at Kemet Fest, K-E-M-E-T-F-E-S-T, on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook Live. Awesome. Yeah. And real quick before uh, we have to wrap up, but um, when uh, for anybody who is interested in going in person, because like you said, it's also available via live stream, uh, when and where is it and how can they uh, get access? Okay, so it's going to be at Montclair Brewery, which is at 101 Walnut Street, Montclair, New Jersey, 07042. And the way that you can get tickets is at Kemet2, I'm sorry, KemetFest2.eventbrite.com, or you can call or text the number 201-463-9363 for tickets. That's great. Thank you again, Rostafa, for coming on to the show with us on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. This has been the Morning Buzz Thank you for listening tomorrow. We will have a compilation show of the best of the week. And trust me, I, I help put it together, except our editor, Mati, actually does it. But I, I, I have a say. So trust me, it's good. Once again, thank you, Rostafa, for coming in with us. We, we hope all the best with the festival, and we really admire all the work that you're doing for Black communities. Thank you. And up next, we have Deeks and Dangles Sports Show. Here we go.